Why do you think someone's dying? It's been a year since one of Sydney's most horrific murders. I can't see any hand, leg, or um. What she saw when she walked in the door would shock her to her core. It's hard to comprehend the murder of one person, much less an entire family. The following stories tell the tale of three tragic, incredibly disturbing slayings of families. These are stories of lives taken far too soon, incredible betrayals by people's own family members. One case took several decades to solve, while another remains unsolved to this very day. Can you imagine looking into the eyes of someone you love and stabbing them to death? What about taking the life of an innocent child or killing simply out of greed. The one thing all of these stories have in common is that they're horrific and will definitely send a shiver down your spine. The story follows one of the most horrific crimes to occur in Australian history. It's focused on a lovely couple, Min Lin and his wife Lily. They had met when they moved from China to Australia for school. They were hardworking, dedicated people. After they got married, they would soon become parents to three children. Their first child was a daughter, 15-year-old Brenda. Then they had 12-year-old Henry and 9-year-old Terry. Brenda was known for being very hardworking, just like her parents, and would make the most out of any opportunities that came her way. Meanwhile, the boys were super into sports, especially badminton. Min and Lily loved their children very much and worked hard to give them anything and everything they needed including the best possible education. In 2002, Min ended up establishing a news agency called Epping Central News Agency. The agency ended up blowing up and becoming very successful. As a result, the Lin family became very well known in their community. Because of their success, the Lin family was able to purchase a nice home for themselves in a safe area of the suburbs. Lily's sister Irene also moved into the same road as them as she would frequently help them out with the business. Min's parents and sister Kathy also lived nearby. It appeared as if the family had the life of their dreams, but everything would soon change completely, forever. On Friday the 17th of July in 2002, the Lynn family went over to Kathy's parents for dinner as they did on a regular basis. Brenda had other plans so she couldn't come. Henry's grandmother asked if he wanted to sleep over that night but he declined because he had plans to play badminton the next morning. Min briefly left around 9 p.m. to drop off some newspapers that would be needed for work the following day. When he returned, he and his family would make their way back into their own house. Early the next morning, the town was a buzz concern and confusion because the famous Epping Central News Agency hadn't opened yet. Even more concerning, all the newspapers that had arrived had never been taken inside and were just piling up outside of the building. It was Saturday morning and Min hadn't told anybody that he wouldn't be arriving at work on time. Where was he? And was he in danger? That's the question everyone wanted to know. Later that morning, Min's sister Kathy received a call from a worried customer who was trying to figure out where Min was. She was immediately worried and she and her husband walked over together to the Lin family home. They quickly realized that the door was unlocked, which was unusual. They let themselves inside. At first, everything seemed perfectly normal. Things were tidy and in their place. It wasn't until Kathy and her husband made their way upstairs that they were met with a sight that was unimaginably disturbing and horrific. It was like a scene out of a horror movie. They were later confronted with unimaginable horror as soon as they opened the door to the master bedroom. Lily had been brutally attacked and killed and gore was smeared all over the walls. As Kathy and her husband moved throughout the house, they would find even more horrific scenes. Irene had also been bludgeoned to death and she was left lying slumped against her bed. Unfortunately, young Terry and Henry would also be found dead, gore stretching everywhere from the corridor to the walls and the ceiling of their room. In a state of panic and shock, Kathy dialed 911. Hello, I need an ambulance to 55A Boundary Road. What's that? So 55A Boundary Road, Epping North, and it's a house? Yes. Yeah, yeah. What's the problem? Yeah, the What's house, wrong? Yeah. What, uh, what's wrong? What's wrong? I'm not sure someone, I think, should <laughs> I think, should I'm not sure. You, you need to tell me why you need an ambulance. What's wrong? Yeah, I think someone dying. I'm not sure. Why do you think someone's dying? I'm, I'm not sure, but maybe someone killed. My, um, my brother's 
Finally. When the paramedics finally arrive on the scene, they find Kathy on the lawn, screaming hysterically. They clearly had a horrific scene on their hands, and Min was still missing. Was he dead along with the rest of his family? Where could he be? Sadly, after police and paramedics did a more thorough search of the master bedroom, they would find that Min had met the same fate as the rest of his family. Kathy and her husband were taken to the hospital to receive treatment for shock. You're probably wondering where Brenda was when all of this was going on. She had been away on a trip and was on her way back to her parents' house to check in with her family. But before she could get there, she happened to log into Facebook. People had blown up her phone with messages about what had happened to her family. They even showed photos of her house, which had been roped off and was an active crime scene. At first, Brenda didn't believe the messages and thought that she was the victim of some kind of joke. But when she finally arrived home, she was approached by police and Kathy, who confirmed that it was true. Her whole family had been killed and she was the sole survivor. In the wake of her family's slayings, Brenda would be forced to come to terms with the fact that her life was forever changed. I'd go to um, my friend's house and you'd see their parents and with their families. And I, I know that. I, I would never have that. And you'd see sometimes, you know, as teenagers, children fight with their families. And I, I'd think that. I'd, I'd give anything to have my, my family back. But whenever I see families now, I sort of smile to myself and I think it's absolutely lovely, and uh, but it's also very bittersweet. It also reminds me of what I don't have, and probably never will. Because of the amount of attention these slangs had gotten throughout the nation, police were under enormous pressure to solve the case. But who would have wanted to kill this lovely, hard-working family? While flowers and people wanting to pay their respects gathered outside the Lynn family business, the police were trying to determine what could have caused this tragedy. One theory was that either Lily or Min had some sort of breakdown and killed the family before killing themselves, but this was quickly proven to be false. The injuries were so severe that it was clear that the attack had been lengthy and caused by an outside party. Whoever had done it would have had to have been extremely familiar with the layout of the house in order to carry out this crime and still get away with it. This was different than most cases police had seen for several reasons. Not only was it incredibly horrific, but whoever had done it seemed to have been able to get inside the house easily. There were also no signs of struggle, and it wasn't a breaking and entering case. Additionally, nothing seemed to have been stolen. Police eventually determined that whoever committed these crimes would have had to have had a key to the property. Given that Brenda's room was completely untouched, it would also appear that whoever was responsible for the killings was also aware that she would not have been home at the time. There was also no gore on her doorknob, unlike all the other bedroom doorknobs in the house. Whoever was behind these slangs must have known the family and known them well. Due to the way the bodily fluids had been spread around the house, it was also determined that the killer had been wearing gloves to cover his tracks. After examining footprints, law enforcement would eventually find out that it was one individual who had entered the Lynn family home that night and committed these crimes. Additionally, because family members had been so brutally disfigured during their killings, it would take forensic help to officially identify them. As more research is done into the case, it's determined that the killings occurred very early in the morning. Also, it was likely that the two young boys were awoken in the night when they heard the rest of their family being killed. It was also clear that the two boys had fought hard against their attackers. The nation was desperate for answers. Police say they are making progress into the deaths of five members of the Lynn family. It's been a year since one of Sydney's most horrific murders and still no charges have been laid. But police say they are making progress with their investigation into the deaths of five members of the Lynn family. 16-year-old Brenda Lynn was overseas when the murder and she's still rebuilding her life after losing her parents, her two brothers, and an aunt. All of the victims suffered blunt force trauma, and all but one of them also suffered from asphyxiation. The weapon was determined to have been some sort of hammer with a rope around it. Kathy, still reeling from what she saw on that horrific day, was called into the police station for questioning. 
My sister is lying, maybe part of body is out of bed, and and also the that the beside the, that one is, uh, I think maybe my brother, but I I can't see any hand, leg, or um, head, or any body, part of my brother's body. Police also would question Kathy's husband Robert through the use of a translator. When I first came to Australia, I didn't know, I didn't know anything about this country. For example, I don't know where to, how to go to one place to another, or I don't know how to state the address. Um, in this case, I would ask him to help me, and he he was quite happy to help me. For example, when we bought a car, uh, my wife cannot use her name to buy a car, so um, we use Ming's name to register a car. Yeah. Um, Henry is a, mm, quite a more open-minded child. He would uh, love to um, get along with other people. He likes to play tennis and badminton. He likes to play badminton with me. While Robert was questioned by the police about the day he and his wife discovered the bodies, he appears to be very emotional. He often had his head in his hands and was crying. This is the response you would expect from someone who just lost five members of his family this tragically. When the police asked how he was able to cope after what happened, he responded saying, this moment, I don't know how to say, but I feel everyone, everyone support us and care us and love us. I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Following the Lynn family slayings, Kathy and Robert took over the news agency and became Brenda's legal guardians. The public provided them with much support, even starting a trust fund for Brenda's schooling. Meanwhile, police are still trying to determine how the killer would have been able to get their hands on the keys, as well as how they would have been so familiar with the layout of the Lynn home. They are beginning to suspect that whoever it was actually knew the family quite well. It's not until they find an undisturbed footprint outside the Lynn family home that they begin to focus on their first suspect. The suspect is probably the last person you are expecting. Police were also examining the emergency call that Kathy made when she discovered the bodies. During the call, she can be heard in her foreign language begging her husband not to leave her alone in the house. But he insists he has to leave because he is too scared. But why would Robert have left his wife alone in the house? Wouldn't he be worried that the killer could still be inside? Something wasn't adding up. After some extensive tests, it's determined that the shoe print police found outside of the Lynn family home matches Robert's very own shoe. He was even photographed wearing them. Now with Robert as their number one suspect, the police decide to secretly install cameras in the home he shared with Kathy and now Brenda. At one point, he's caught cutting up a shoe box into small pieces and then flushing them down the toilet. The box turned out to be the shoe box that contained the same shoes that made the imprint outside of the Lynn family home. Finally, police made their first move against Robert by searching his house and vehicle, and what they'll find inside will make him look guiltier than ever. It's a trace blood stain found in his garage. When it was tested, it was determined that it was a match with the Min family victims. On May 5th, 2011, Robert was officially arrested for the deaths of his family members. Despite the fact that Kathy believed he was innocent, police believed he sedated her the night of the killings, so she would think he was at home when really he wasn't. It's believed that he only intended to kill the adults, but because the boys woke up, he had to kill them too. What could have possibly possessed Robert to kill his family? A likely motive is that he was jealous of Min's success and wanted to take over the business. Robert pleaded not guilty to the killing and wouldn't go to trial until 2014. During the trial, it was revealed that Robert had been taking advantage of Brenda by engaging in inappropriate acts. He might have considered that if she took away her family, she would have no choice but to move in with him. Robert's trial would continue into 2015, but it would end up with a hung jury because they could not come to a unanimous decision about if he was guilty or not. In February of 2017, Robert would finally be brought to justice when a final trial would end in a guilty verdict. He was sentenced to five consecutive life sentences. While justice was served, it did not bring Brenda's family back, nor did it bring an end to her suffering. At, at this point in time, I haven't quite processed it properly and I don't even know how I'm, I'm meant to feel about this or how I'm meant to describe how it's affected me. 
However, through the support of those around her, Brenda has found some healing. But it took amazing people in the wider community who've done amazing things. And I've seen that the majority of humanity being, I think I've seen the good in people. This case is particularly interesting because it's still currently active. This case takes place in Setagaya, Japan, on the night of December 30th, 2000. Mikio Mikawaza and Yasuko were a married couple who had two children named Nina and Rai. The nation is bustling with activity as everyone is preparing to welcome the new millennium on New Year's Eve. While most people are in celebration mode, there is a woman in Tokyo who's trying to get into contact with her daughter, son-in-law, and grandchildren. The family in question was the Miyazas, and the lives of their extended family was about to be changed forever. The family lived in a safe neighborhood. The parents worked hard to provide for their children. Mikio worked in software development, while Yasuko was a very dedicated teacher. They loved their children very much. Nina was an intelligent and adorable eight-year-old girl. She loved ballet and would often show off her dancing skills to her family. She loved her little brother, Ray, who was just six years old. He had a goofy personality and a curious nature. He also had special needs, which meant that he would require a little extra care and attention. The children grew up in a very happy, peaceful household, at least until tragedy struck their home. On December 30th, the family spent their day hanging out and relaxing. They then decided to go shopping before stopping for dinner. They then settled back into the home to watch a movie. Family was very important to the Miwaza family, and they liked seeing their extended family as much as possible. In fact, Yasuko's mother, Haruko, lived a short distance away from their family. It was very common for him to call and check in on the family in the mornings. Just like she always did, Haruko called up her daughter on the morning of December 31st. But strangely, when she dialed their number, they wouldn't go through. This was very strange and hadn't happened before. In fact, it had been entirely disconnected. Immediately, Haruko got the gut feeling that something was wrong. And so she decided to drive to her daughter's house straight away. When she knocked at the door, no one answered. As she began to panic, she realized that the door was unlocked, so she let herself in. What she saw when she walked in the door would shock her to her core. There was gore everywhere, and her son-in-law was lying at the bottom of the stairs. He had been brutally stabbed to death. Haruko was living in her own worst nightmare. While screaming at the top of her lungs, she raced upstairs and realized with horror that her daughter and little granddaughter had also been jabbed to death. Desperately clinging to hope, she ran to her sweet, beloved grandson's room, only to find that he had been strangled to death while lying in his own bed. Her screams of agony were so loud that the neighbors heard and called the police, and they arrived quickly at the scene. Taksha Tashida was the police chief who was presiding over the case. He and his colleagues were desperate to find justice for this innocent family. He found this case to be so horrifically disturbing that he was never able to get the faces of the victims out of his mind. The case disturbed the rest of the nation as well, as news of what happened quickly spread. Meanwhile, Haruko entered a period of deep shock to the point that she nearly blacked out. Police were tasked with figuring out how the killer had managed to get into the family's home. The house was backed up against a park that was lined with trees. There were plenty of areas where someone could have quickly slipped over into their property line without being noticed. Police believed that the killer might have managed to climb a tree high enough that they were able to gain access to an upstairs window of the home. The killer may have removed the window screen and let themselves into an upstairs bathroom. Room. But this was only a theory. Police have never been able to determine exactly how the killer got inside. Because Haruko was in such a state of shock, she couldn't recall if she had let herself into the house using a key or if the door had already been unlocked. If the door had already been unlocked, then this was most likely not a breaking and entering type of situation. Police believe that the first victim was Little Ray. He was found to have been strangled by someone's bare hands. His father would have heard the noise and ran upstairs to see what was going on. 
While he might have been able to injure the attacker in some way, the attacker was armed with a knife while he had no weapon. It was determined that the killer stabbed Mikio so brutally that the blade of the knife came out. After his first two kills, the attacker would move throughout the rest of the upstairs rooms to kill first Yasuko and then Mina. It was clear he had stabbed them many, many times, even after they were already dead. What kind of sick person would have this much rage towards a loving family? After completely wiping out this entire family, the killer really had the audacity to make themselves comfortable in the home where they would stay from anywhere between two and 10 hours. They ate food out of the family's fridge and even made themselves a cup of tea. They even used the family's medical supplies to treat the wounds they had sustained while Makio was trying to fight them off in order to save his son. The killer took a nap on the family's couch and also used their computer to conduct an internet search. They did all of this while the bodies of the victims lay scattered throughout the house. The killer did leave some pieces of evidence behind at the scene. This included a knife and even a shirt. The shirt they had left behind was rather a rare piece of clothing because the company that made it only made about 130. They had hoped to be able to use this shirt to track the killer, but their efforts were fruitless. Another one of the items that the killer left behind was a bag. The bag contained some sand that when analyzed was determined to be from the Nevada desert. In fact, it was likely from an area not far from an Air Force base in California. Police were able to find some DNA samples from the killer throughout the home, including fingerprints. But when they searched for this DNA in their criminal database, nothing came up. This led police to believe that the killer was either not from Japan or that he had no criminal record. The killer was also determined to have type A blood, which did not match anyone in the family of victims. It was also determined that the killer was a male, likely of mixed descent, and that they had some European ancestry on their mother's side. Because the killer could virtually be anywhere, the Metropolitan Police were called in to help. Due to the amount of pressure from the nation to find justice for the family, the police were desperate for help and even released a mock-up of what they believed the killer could look like. The mock up included the bag and some other pieces of clothing that the killer had left behind. The killer was relatively short at only five foot four and very slender. They were also pretty young, probably between the ages of 15 and 35. This is because they would have had to have been at peak physical health to manage to fight off and overcome all of these victims. News coverage about this case was very heavy at the time and the theories were spreading across the nation about what could have happened. Some people speculated that the clothing left at the scene looked as if they belonged to someone who liked to skate. There was also a skate park right by the family home. It was possible that Makio would have grown annoyed by the noise from the skaters and gone to complain. It's also possible that one of the skaters was angry about his complaints and decided to seek revenge. One particular journalist took a great interest in the case and even wrote a book about it. He believed that the killer was a former soldier from the South Korean army who had become a hitman and that perhaps he had been paid off to kill the family. But this still begs the question why? Who would have had it out for this sweet family? The case had become highly talked about but police had few leads. The entire home was blocked off with tarps and a gate to keep out curious onlookers. Thousands of officers were involved in the case and box after box of evidence was collected. The police questioned those in the local area, talked to friends and neighbors, and tried to desperately come up with some sort of motive that would explain what appeared to be a perfectly random crime. Despite the fact that there was so much evidence and they were able to uncover so many details about the killer, they were never able to confirm their identity. Even though many years have now passed and no justice has been served for this poor family, police have not given up and are still determined to figure out why this tragedy happened. Who do you think killed this entire family in such a brutal way? And why? Let us know in the comments. This story is focused on a young couple from California. It was the year 2004, and Lindsay Cutshaw and Jason Allen were working as counselors at a Christian summer camp called Rock and Water Christian Awakening Camp. While they were there, they would teach children lessons from the Bible and take them on fun adventures. 
which sometimes included white water rafting. Lindsay was 22 and Jason was 26 at the time. They loved their jobs and loved one another. Neither Jason nor Lindsay were actually from California. Lindsay had grown up in Ohio with a preacher father and Jason was from Michigan. The couple had met two years prior, working as camp counselors and instantly bonded. They shared a love for God and for nature. They had dreams of one day opening up a summer camp of their own when they were older and had more money. Despite the fact that they were still relatively young, they believed that they were meant to be together forever and got engaged not long after meeting. They weren't in a huge rush to get married though and planned for the wedding to take place in about two years. On the evening of Friday the 13th, the pair decided to take the weekend and go on a little trip together. Lindsay had dreamed of visiting San Francisco and because they both had time off, this would be the perfect time for the trip. They planned to take Lindsay's older Ford Tempo and return back to camp by Sunday evening. But when Monday rolled around and the pair were expected back for work, they were nowhere to be found. Lindsay had told a few friends that they might visit San Francisco, but neither of them had been very detailed about specific plans. It was soon determined that they were missing and possibly in danger. Both Lindsay and Jason's parents were notified and the couples came out quickly to help search for their children. Police had very little to go off of and knew that the couple would essentially be anywhere. Luckily, several days after their disappearance, police would come across another case that would yield more information. They were notified that a man had hiked up a mountain but was struggling to get back down and needed assistance so a helicopter was sent to rescue him. While the pilot was rescuing the stranded man, he happened to notice what appeared to be two bodies laying on the beach neither were moving. Investigators went out to locate the bodies and made a very startling discovery. There on the beach was one man and one woman, both lying next to each other in their sleeping bags. They had both been shot, killed, and robbed of all their belongings. It would sadly be determined that these were the bodies of Jason and Lindsay. They had been killed with a rifle while they slept. Who would have wanted to hurt this kind and loving couple? Police knew that hitchhikers and homeless people would often hang out in this area, so that was their immediate suspicion. They did find some interesting evidence around the scene, including parts of a journal containing writings from the couple, a hat, and a bottle of beer. Police had very little to go off of and needed the public's help. In 2006, a $50,000 reward was posted for any information regarding the case. Many, many years would go by, and it looked as if the case was becoming cold. Would Jason and Lindsay's parents ever find justice? But finally, in spring of 2017, police would come forward to tell the world that there had been a breakthrough in the case. On May 5th, Sonoma County Sheriff Steve Freitas would hold a press conference about this update. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Steve Freitas, the sheriff here in Sonoma County. I'd like to make a brief statement and then I'll take some questions. I'm pleased to announce that the sheriff's office has made a major breakthrough in the investigation surrounding the murders of Jason Allen and Lindsay Cutshaw that took place in August 2004 in Jenner. Many of us will never forget when Sonoma County was rocked by the discovery of a young innocent couple found murdered on a secluded beach where they spent the night. Jason and Lindsay were just 26 and 22 years old at the time of their deaths, he began. The sheriff would go on to say that they finally had a suspect who they had apprehended. His name was Sean Guyon a California man who would later be arrested for killing his own brother. Sean had a long history of misconduct that the sheriff explained that he had taken the lives of these two young people for no other reason than out of spite. Sean pleaded guilty to the murders and was ultimately sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. This case is further proof that the men and women for the sheriff's office will never give up in protecting our community and seeking justice for crime victims. The sheriff said. The parents of both Lindsay and Jason were grateful for law enforcement's tireless efforts to find justice for their children after all these many years. The director of the camp that the couple worked for, Craig Lomaz, also expressed relief that the case had been solved after all this time. Excited. Um, this isn't something that I was expecting to happen. I'd kind of given up hope. Thanks for watching, you guys. Make sure you give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more real horror stories.